CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Remember the old nursery rhyme? Punch and Judy went to town to see what they could see. A highwayman took all their clothes and hung them on a tree. They asked a farmer what to do. He said, Do not complain. Punch and Judy turned around and went back home again. That was written 300 years ago. The story we're about to tell you happened yesterday. Our honeymoon's ruined. My husband was going to take me to the most expensive dinner in the city tonight. Now I can't go. Of course you can, Mrs. Connor. You just leave it to us folks in television. <laughs> By the time we tell your story to the TV audience, you and your husband will be the most celebrated couple to hit the big city. But we have no money. Mr. Connor getting robbed and your honeymoon is going to be the luckiest thing that ever happened to you. <laughs> mystery drama, Big City Blues, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Russell Horton and Marion Haley. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It made all the headlines. It could have been written by O. Henry, said the newsman. Interestingly enough, neither Harold nor his wife, Marge Connor, minded at all if we used their real names. It was the big city where it happened. They objected. Probably because it was sort of embarrassing the way it turned out. So when the mayor asked us not to say where this happened, we agreed and said, okay, we'll call it Big City. It began the day Marge and Harold checked into the Big Glass Hotel in Big City. Uh, you had a reservation. Uh, what did you say your name was? Mr. Mr. And, uh, oh, <laughs> uh, Harold Connor. Mm -hmm. Connor. Mr. and Mrs. Harold. Uh, for how long was that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, a week, we hope. Until the money runs out. Uh, until the money... Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Connor. No, I don't seem to find the name. Is that Connor with a K or a C? Uh, with an H. H, Connor. Uh, the last name. The last oh, name. Oh, the, the last, uh, a Connor with a C. You don't have it? I, I made the reservation a month ago. You did, Harold. Mm. You didn't tell me. Didn't I? Oh, sure I did. But how could you be so sure I'd say yes? Oh. I knew. Well, I'm sorry, but that just... How could you know? Well, we'd waited for three years, baby face. Neither of us were getting any younger. Oh. I knew you'd have to give in and marry me sometime. Oh, <laughs> you man, you're so sure of yourself. Well, I am sorry, sir, but we just don't seem to have any record. Jump in glory, Oscar, you've got to. Uh, We've come all this way. I, I telephoned directly from Barrows Point. You call from Barrows Point? Barrows Point, Maine. Uh, well, did you send a deposit? What's that? Mm, I see. Well, I'm sorry, but we have got no room. We are full up. Oh, my. Oh, what a way to begin a honeymoon. Did, did you say honeymoon? Uh-huh. Well, that puts an entirely different complexion on the matter. The honeymoon file. Oh, yes. Here we are. Here we are, the honeymoon suite. Mr. and Mrs. Harold Connor. Well, happy honeymoon, folks. You'll find a bottle of champagne and a basket of fruit in your suite. Compliments of the management. Now, just sign the register here, Mr. Connor. Fun! Oh, Harold. Just look at the view of the city from this window. Why, it's spectacular. You shouldn't have said that about we are staying here until the money runs out, lovey. What are they going to think? Well, how much money do we have for our honeymoon? We mm, have enough. I don't want my little bride to worry herself about that. Well, Harold, you've got to stop talking to me as if I were a teenage bride. Lovey, baby face, I'm... 
28. So what? I'm 34. We're mature people. We don't talk like that. Even on a honeymoon? <laughs> I don't see what age has to do with it. My parents married at 40. Honey bun. <laughs> oh, Harold, I don't see your dad calling his 40-year-old bride your mother honey bun. Oh, now, let me think. What do I wear tonight? Oh, our first big night on the town. Where are we going, Hal? To the most expensive restaurant the taxi driver will take us to. My taxi? A taxi cab? Oh, sure. Oh. That's what everybody does in big city. Uh, uh, yes, uh, who is it? Telegram. A telegram for us? Who knows we're here? Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, well, I uh, did tell a couple of the fellas at the lumber yard. You told a couple of... Oh, and my brother, too, of course. Boy... Was he envious? Where you go on your honeymoon, Harold? It's supposed to be a secret. Telegram, I got a telegram for you. I don't think we ought to open the door. You know what they say? It could be anybody. Um, uh, slip it under the door, will you? You have to sign for it. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Harold Connor. It's all right. He knows our name. Mr. Connor? Uh, that's me. You sign here, please. Thanks. Uh... Oh, uh, you don't happen to have a pencil on you, do you? Uh, no, I don't, Mr. Carter. But I have this. Uh, <gasps> oh, it's got a gun. Uh, shall we go quietly back <gasps> into your room, Mr. and Mrs. Carter, and shut the door? Hey, uh, uh, watch where you're pointing, Matt. Uh, uh, what, what is this? Can't you guess? You're being robbed. <laughs> out of this phone. Oh, you didn't leave us a single thing held my wedding ring, my engagement ring, my earring. What did you do with this phone? They, they got it all marked off with names. I dialed room service. I dialed <laughs> bell captain. Nothing. Hello? Hello? Oh, cool Lee was. Took everything and faked us and walked out of here like it was an old friend. There's only two more things left to dial. Barber shop and beauty parlor. Oh. Uh, hello, Mrs. Carter. My name's Ronald. I'm the desk clerk. Uh, 
Who's that with you? I'm Don Purvis. Celebrity Corner? Channel 9? Uh, we don't get Channel 9 in Barrows Point. We, uh, don't get any channels. Oh, we'll open the door, Harold. We're wasting time. Oh, uh, excuse me. I have to close the door to open it. Yeah. Well, uh, come in. Come in. Oh, this is simply awful, Mr. Connor. I do apologize. Uh, did you call the police? Well, I certainly did. This man just walked in here and robbed us blind. Our, our good clothes, our, her watch, my watch, all our money. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Whatever must you think of our security? I don't know what to do. I I can't pay for this room. Uh, uh, this suite. Uh, can't pay for that. Hey, sir. Well, don't you worry, Mr. Connor. I'll see to it that the hotel gives you this room for as long as you want to stay. Uh, now, Don, let's not exaggerate. Ron. These folks have suffered mightily on their first visit to the big city. And I doubt very much if the folks watching Celebrity Corner on 9 would be very happy about you kicking the Connors out. Kicking them out? Who ever said such a thing? I'll show you how we do things around here. <laughs> yeah, hello, Oscar. Oscar, you send up another bottle of champagne and a basket of fruit. Uh, make that two baskets of fruit. Honeymoon sweet. Oh, and Oscar... Uh, put in some extra seedless grapes. Seedless grapes? Oh, Harold was going to take me to the most expensive dinner in the city. <laughs> no, we can't go. Of course you can, honey. You just leave it to your Uncle Don. We have Channel 9. We do the news right, believe you me. By the time we've covered this story, and we'll cover it in depth, Harold and Marge, you will be the most celebrated couple ever to hit the big city. Dinner any way you want. But who's going to pick up the tab? Oh, you just don't know, Mr. Connor, how generous this big town can be. Getting robbed is going to be the luckiest thing that ever happened to you. Well, how anybody got a hold of your names and came up here is a complete mystery to me. I really must talk to Mr. Sheraton about that. Now, Marge, Harold, before the police show up with all their questions and so forth, I want you both to tell me a little about yourselves. Now, I can see by looking at you that you're celebrating your anniversary. Am I right? Now, which is it? The fifth or the tenth? Oh. I wonder if what's happening to Marge and Harold Connor has happened to other honeymooners. It may have, but I hope not often. In this case, the plight of these unfortunate honeymooners so captured the imagination and compassion of the people of the big city that everyone wanted to help. Their bad news produced lots of good Samaritans. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. is just beginning for the honeymooners from the state of Maine. The police came and wanted to know what did the robber look like. Marge said he was tall. Harold said he was short. Marge said he was young. Harold said he was old. The police shook their heads and sadly went their misinformed way. That evening, those who tuned in to Celebrity Corner heard this. Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is Don Purvis. Your purveyor of the perceptive, perfidious, perfumed, and performed. It's your old headline hunter, Don Purvis, host of Celebrity Corner, hangout of the famous and infamous. Tonight, our special guests are Marge and Harold Connor. Now, Marge, tell me, what are you doing in the big city? Uh, we're here on our honeymoon, Don. No kidding. And, Harold, where are you from? Uh, Barrows Point, Maine. Barrows Point, Maine. Think of that. All the way from Maine. And tell me, what made you pick Big City for your honeymoon, Marge? Uh, we've always wanted to come here, Don. Yep. Uh, fo folks up our way told us it's a great place to have fun. And it sure is. Marge, tell me, how have you been enjoying it so far? Well, I don't know, Don. This is our first night. We haven't seen much of Big City yet. Well, Harold, what plans do you have for you two honeymooners? Uh, uh, we don't have any more because... Uh... Well, we don't have any money. You don't have any money? Mm -hmm. We don't have any clothes either. Just uh, what we've got on our back. No clothes? I can't talk about this anymore. I want to go home. Oh, <laughs> jump and glory. Oski, oh, now you've made her cry. Well, now, just wait. Now, Marge, tell me what's the matter. Oh, what's this, this man? He, he, he came into our hotel room this afternoon and stole everything. 
My wedding ring. Oh, honey. You, you made me take it off. I don't know what it for me. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you watching Celebrity Corner, what you are seeing is the complete, unvarnished, total, true truth. These youngsters, these folks came here to the big city with love and big dreams, and they were robbed. Now, are we who make this thriving metropolis our home going to let them return to Barrows Point? Remembering that our town was the end of the line for them instead of the beginning of a wonderful life? Now, our telephone number is 555-1242. Call that number with charity in your hearts and unselfishness in your soul. Let us show these two lovely people from our sister state that we're all brothers. That indeed this can be Samaritan City and not the Sin City that it seems to them. This is Don Purvis, your host on Celebrity Corner, and bless you one and all, and a good, good night. Who is it? Uh, Don Purvis, kids, open up. Don Purvis. Oh, let him in, let him in, Hal. Hi, everybody. I thought I'd find out how the world was treating you today. Well, what is this? What did you do, rob a department store? Don't that, even in funny. This place looks like a warehouse. Well, uh, folks have been sending us stuff uh, since early this morning. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Folks, we don't even know. Ah, but they do know you, Harold. And in another 24 hours, everybody in town will know you. You know, I picked up five more stations on account of last night's broadcast. Before the end of the week, you'll be getting stuff from all over the United States. It's on every wire service, the story, your pictures. Maybe even at home? We'll be in the point time. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh. What's that, Harold? Oh, a uh, Fenwick spin fly fishing tackle. Rod, gear. <laughs> Wait till I hit the trout with this. Oh, and I got a whole box of tunic shirt things on. Look. One in black, one in white, a green, one orange, pink, pink, blue. And this color. Well, I don't even know what it is. Well, it's a lilac, I'd say. Oh. Light lavender. Oh, and they're all my size. Uh, read the card, Marge. To Marge Connor, a fashion shirt for every day in the week. Happy honeymoon. How do you like this, Don? A sheepskin pistol case with a pistol in it. <laughs> uh, the card says, The next guy who tries to get funny with you, give him a shot of this. <laughs> hey, and what's this? A goldfish bowl? With five goldfish. Kind of funny looking. You all turn around and look at me when I get close. I don't know. I wouldn't put my finger in there if I were you. They look like piranhas to me. Oh. And someone sent us two tickets to a jail game yes. tonight. What? Yes. Look at these, Don. What's a jail game? J <laughs> That's high lie. It's like handball played with baskets. It's real fast. You'll love it. Uh, well, and a concert tomorrow at the uh, Abraham Lincoln Center. And a free pass to the top of the big city sky room. And, and, and a free lunch. Uh, what else? Oh, two tickets to a helicopter ride. And just wait till you see this, Don. I'll be right back. I, I put it on the bed. Over there, three matching suitcases, real leather. I, I uh, felt them. And uh, in the bedroom, a whole slew of jackets and pants and, and, and shirts and ties. And you know what? <laughs> Even pajamas. Well, what do you think? Oh, turn around, honey. Hey, that is some fur coat. Well, now, kids, it's time for business. I've set it up with the Channel 9 camera crew, and they're on their way. First, I think we'll reenact this whole scene. I come in, you show me the presents, and so on and so on. Then... You're going to put us on television again, Don? Tonight, I want to show the folks out in TV land the results of their generosity. I'll be better tonight. I won't cry. Oh. That's probably them now. Hey, Come on in, boys. Well, there's our friend Ron from the front desk with a whopping big dog on a leash. I brought up two more presents for you. Whoa! Oh, wait a minute. Here, take this box, will you, Don, before I drop it? I'm going to the doggy! Yeah, it's a Doberman Pinscher. It's a present from the National Kennel Club. Uh, their card says that... Ah, yeah, here, here. For your protection, a man's best friend. I'll close the door so you can let him run around. And uh, that big box star I just put on the coffee table, that's for you folks, too. A uh, full set of china. Service for eight, I think. Well, let me see. Oh, this is. We don't have to buy any. Oh, Don, I tell you, it's been some morning. It's just incredible. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> the card says service for eight for a lifetime of good eating for the honeymoon couple and a big family. They expect us to have 
six kids? <laughs> well, there's a crowd of reporters down there. You wouldn't believe the lobby is a mad house. Well, who's complaining? I'll tell you what, Ron. First, I want my crew here to get this for tonight's show. Then we'll let those newspaper scavengers come up for their scrap. Uh, well, is it uh, is it all right if I uh, stay up here while, while you're taping? Well, why not? But why? Well, I, I'd like to make just a wee statement as to how this generous hotel management is permitting the Connors to remain in the honeymoon suite without charge for the rest of the week. Shut up and glory after the dogs busted all the dishes. Stop! Stop! Lord, he's into the seedless grape. It's all right, Marge. I, I, uh, I've got him by the leash. Oh, oh. Look at this room. Everything's on the floor. Oh, what a mess. Now, here, boy. Come on, boy. I'll uh, tie him up to the bit. Oh, I hate all this. You're lucky the dog didn't get into the piranhas. Oh, the dish is broken. All that wasted food. Now, 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 Mrs. Connor. I'll take care of this right away. <laughs> I wonder what's keeping my crew. Oh, oh, hello, Oscar. This is Ron. Send up another fruit basket to the honeymoon suite. Uh, mostly seedless grapes. You heard me. I said grapes. Uh, say, Bob, uh, what's all this? Sir? All those flags everywhere. Oh. <laughs> do you notice they're all the same? Yes, well, we do that when a dignitary visits the hotel. Uh, that's our flag. Stay to me. Oh, you recognized it. <laughs> Three dozen of them, 36, yeah. all in honor of our guests. Yes, your guests, Marge and Harold Connor. Yeah. Oh, lovely people. You know them? I'd like to see them. Well, I, I'm afraid that's not possible, sir. Uh, the Connors aren't in right now. Oh, no? Where are they? Well, let me see what time it is. Oh, uh -huh, it's 11 o'clock. Well... In just half an hour, they're at a little ceremony at the mayor's mansion. Uh, keys to the city, you know. Ceremony at the mayor's. Well, well, well. Oh, they are lovely, deserving people. <laughs> After what they've been through. Well, I think I'll get myself over there. Mm. Uh, well, just for the record, uh, could I have your name, sir? Augustus. Chief Augustus of the Barris Point Police Force. Barris Point... Well, that's where the Connors come from. They sure do. Well, then you must know them, Chief. I sure do. Do you mind my seeing your badge? I mean, you being in plain clothes. <laughs> uh, you know how people try to fool you. How's this? And I need not emphasize that we in the big city pride ourselves on treating every visitor, every stranger, as if he were a neighbor. That is what has made our big city big. The B stands for big heart and brotherhood. And we are all brothers. The I for impetuousness. And that we are. And the G for goodwill. So, without further ado, on behalf of... This is Don Purvis again. You're watching the ceremony at the mayor's mansion on the occasion of making our honeymooners welcome. Margaret, yes, Margaret. Mrs. Connor is wearing a lilac tunic and matching slacks. Harold Connor. Mr. Connor is wearing a brand new sheepskin jacket. To present you both with the and the key is now being handed over to. Oh, Mr. Connor dropped the key, but he quickly picks it up. And there goes the sanitation department van playing hail to the mayor. Uh, excuse me, Bob. Can I get by? I don't know where you can get to. The police have cordoned off the whole area. Nobody can get through until the guests of honor are back in the city limousine. Uh, where are they going? Back to the hotel. They're going to plant a main pine tree in the park, but that's the two this afternoon. There goes the limousine now. There they go. <laughs> What's that? What, what's that badge you're flashing? I'm a chief of police at Barris Point. And I have a warrant here for the arrest of Harold Connor. You have What? Wait, wait, hold it a minute. They're cutting me in for a closing announcement. And that's the way it is today, folks. This is Don Purvis at the Mayor's Mansion. I return you now to Channel 9. Oh, back at the old hotel. Good to put my tail down and my feet up. Imagine the mayor himself. Oh, it's a pretty big thing here. Effie. It's the most exciting thing, Hill, that's ever happened to me. I bet the folks in Bell's Point just won't believe it. They'll be so envious. Especially your brother. Well, maybe. Don't know why, though. He's 
Got a good job at home. Everyone respects him. Oh, he was always jealous of you, even in school, remember? <laughs> I try not to. I hope they're not bringing us another dog. <laughs> I'll go. Hello, Don. Wasn't that exciting at the mayor's? Come on in. And Augustus. Augustus Carter, we were just talking about you. Uh, howdy, Harold. Oh, this is a nice surprise, Augustus. Did you come all the way down here to see us? Harold, I just found out myself that the chief of police is, is your own brother. Of all the coincidences, it's amazing. <laughs> Augustus, we were just this minute talking about you, and you walk in. Yeah, I'm not here on a pleasure trip. Mr. Purvis has just taken me to the local precinct, so... We can have you placed under arrest, Harold. Brought back to Barris Point. Arrest me? Well, what for? Augustus, if this is some kind of a joke, I don't like it. It's no joke. It's for passing a bum check. That's the charge. Augustus, you must be crazy. Yeah, your check, your signature, no money in the bank. When I left Barris Point, the bank said more were coming in. Don, can you do something? Mrs. Connor, don't ask me. I, I feel like a fool. I should have guessed. Guessed what? You don't believe this. How do I even know you were robbed? You could have come up here with empty suitcases, and who would know? I should have listened to my sixth sense. Don, I thought you were a friend. Mr. and Mrs. Connor. Connor the con artist. Man, oh man, you sure conned the big city. <laughs> Perhaps it would have been better if, like Punch and Judy, who went to town in that old nursery rhyme, Marge and Harold Connor had turned around and gone straight back to Maine. Can it be that Harold is wanted back home on bad trek charges? Or is it all a mistake? True or false, one way or the other, we'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. we started with an old nursery rhyme, appropriate, we thought, for this once upon a time mystery, let us remind you of another. Once there were two brothers. The story's true, the story's sad. The trouble was, you couldn't tell which was good and which was bad. Let's find out. Well, our hotel has sure quieted down. And yeah, so's the whole town, Ron. Don... You're the only one I can talk to about this. So I'm I'm glad you could join me after hours here. Well, oh, what a jerk I was. What a dope. But how would you know? How could you help it? You were as calm as the rest of us. Have another one on me. No, thanks. You know I almost lost my job on account of those two. Oh, so did I. Mr. Sheridan finally calmed down and said he'd forget the whole thing if... I'd pay for the flags and the seedless grave. Well, I had to get on the air last night and apologize. Well, you heard me. Oh. Oh, oh well, I'm sorry I didn't catch the show, Don. What? But I had to personally go up and help the maids clean up the honeymoon suite. And personally, I had to take everything back to the people who gave it. But this is so embarrassing. I, well, I just felt like such a fool. You can imagine what the mayor feels like. The newspapers came out and said he ought to be locked up with his own key to the city. Yeah, Tim, do you... Do you really think the Connors weren't even robbed? Well, it wouldn't surprise me. They couldn't even get together on a description of the thief. Was he fat, thin, tall, short, young, old? I mean, that alone should have wised me up. Mm, well, it must have been hard for that chief of police you not know, to come down here and arrest his own brother. You know what my assignment is now, Ron? Mm -hmm. They're taking me off Celebrity Corner until Harold Connor is convicted and the air is cleared. I... I don't understand. I have to go up there to this Barrows Point, all the way up to Maine, and cover the trial of that one-horse crook in that one-horse town myself. It's like adding insult to injury. Me, Don Purvis, like like some stringer for the network. Boy, some come down. But when are you going up, Don? Well, the trial's Tuesday. I thought I'd get up there on Monday. And that's when I have to go, too. You? Mm-hmm. I'm supposed to contact a local lawyer and sue the Connors for the rent that they didn't pay here. I said to Mr. Sheraton, do we really have to? Nobody was booked into the honeymoon suite that week anyway. 
No, he said to me. It's a matter of principle, Ronald. So, why don't we go up to Barrow's Point together? Why not? Don, are you sure this is where the Connors live? So they told me, Ronald, where I rented the car. Well, I've been thinking. It isn't really right, our uh, busting in to see them the day before the trial. Look, if Channel 9 sees fit to bust me out of a catbird seat and put me in the hot seat, I'm going to do the job like any other television investigative reporter. Well, you know, that day they snapped on handcuffs, you said some pretty harsh things to Harold. You know, calling the Connors con artists. Not harsh, forthright. Well, anyway, Harold said somebody else must have taken his checkbook. That he never passed a bum check in his life. And they seem such... Like such nice people. You'll pardon me, Ron, if I'm somewhat skeptical. Come on, we're wasting time. I can't. Why not? I haven't the face. I'm up here in Barrow's Point to get a lawyer to sue them for the hotel room. I, I, I can't just drop in on them as if, as if we were old friends. All right, then stay in the car. <sighs> All right, if you put it that way. Don Purvis. Sweetie Pie, it's Don, that celebrity corner television man from Big City. Oh, and uh, the room clerk from the hotel. I didn't see you stand in behind Don. Uh, <laughs> come on in, folks. Come right in. Uh, little wife and I, we're really glad to see you. Now, sit right there. That's our best sofa. Comfortable, isn't it? Oh, oh yes, it's very uh, well, <clears throat> actually, we're sorry to barge in on you like this. Well, but, actually, uh, it's my fault. Ron came along with me, and, uh, well... What is it, Don? Well, to tell you the truth, in spite of the millions of words that I've blabbed into a microphone, now that I sit here with you in your little house, I... <sighs> I just don't know exactly where to begin. Shall we tell them, Hal? Uh, let me, sweet. Uh, Mr. Purvis, I... I suppose you were quite within your rights to say to us the things you did. Maybe I would have, too, if I didn't know me very well. No, you really can't blame Don. Everything seemed to point to us. Well, speaking personally, I was always sure there was some explanation. I never really doubted your integrity. Is there some explanation, Harold? Well, I can only guess at the uh, explanation or what the lawyer calls the motivation. Well, what's the truth? Can you tell me that? And the truth is, just what I said it was when we were hustled out of big city. I'm innocent. Now, Harold, you know what writing a bum check is, don't you? Of course we do. Everybody does. It's writing a check against bums you don't have. Now, honey, let me. Um, what is true, Don, is I didn't have but a couple of dollars left in my account. I drew almost everything out for our honeymoon. And you didn't write checks against no funds? Nope. Not me. Well, who did? Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you. Well, someone else took checks of yours and then... Not checks, Don. Just one. You mean forged your signature and got the money? Mm, not exactly like that, but pretty much. Well, you have proof of this? My lawyer does. And he says you're in the clear? Absolutely. This proof is good enough to stand up in court tomorrow? There isn't going to be any trial tomorrow. Oh, do you hear that, Don? Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. You have no idea. No trial? Well, is that all you can say? Yep. You mean that's all you will say? Yep. All right, then. We'll just have to find out for ourselves. Yep. Yes, you'll have to. Would anyone like a cup of coffee? Well, now, I don't think I'd mind... <laughs> I'd like one. No, thanks. We're leaving. Thank you both. And uh, all I can say is this is all very mysterious and peculiar. Ah, Don Purvis, I don't understand you at all. Why were you so short with the Connors? Why get so hot under the collar and duck out all of a sudden? They're in the clear. They're innocent. Yes, yeah, so they say. You don't believe them? Well, I need corroboration. But you act like you wish they were guilty. Look... If they're innocent, and the whole thing is some mistake by the chief of police of this dear place, then we've had egg pushed into our faces two times in a row. Besides that, if I don't come up with one heck of a story, it may be my last story. And I kid you not, Ron. Remember, I was the one who put the Connors on page one in the first place. <laughs> 
Yes, but, but what would be the point in their saying what they said? If I knew that, I wouldn't be rushing back to the courthouse before it closes for the day. Oh, is that where we're going? That's where we were going. Oh, sounds like we've had a blow-up. Let me get over to the curb. All right, I'm going to go take a look. Rotten luck. Front left tire flat as a pancake. Look, I'll stay with this lame buggy since I took it out in the company name, Ron. Hmm? You get yourself over to car hire where I picked this up and tell him to come get me, huh? Well, why don't you just jack it up and change the tire? Because there is no spare. This was the only car I could rent, so I took it. Now beat it. And look, don't come back here, Ron. The courthouse closes at three. Go see the judge and see what you can find out. And if there is no trial tomorrow... Find out the reason why. Well, why would he tell me? Because you'll ask him to. Now beat it. That will be one dollar and fifteen cents, please. Did you say a dollar fifteen? Operator, I only have quarters on me. I'm sorry, I'm unable to give you any change. But if I put five quarters in, the telephone company will owe me a dime. What can I do about it? Well, how about you returning me the dime I put in to get you in the first place, and then I'll owe you a dollar and a quarter. The charge is one dollar and fifteen cents, not a dollar and a quarter. We could mail you the difference. But think of the postage you'll save if you do it my way. Do you wish to complete this long distance call, or don't you, sir? No, don't you understand? Friend, what I'm saying. Yes or no, sir. Oh, oh, forget it. If you wish to cancel the call, you'll have to hang up, sir. No, 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 I don't mean that. Don't. Here's your money. Sheridan, uh, Ronald Davis here calling from Barrows Point, Maine. I am sorry to call you on your private line, sir, but this is an emergency. No, no, I didn't get that local lawyer to sue the Connors because they are innocent. Yes, I just had a heart-to-heart with the judge. And it seems somebody passed one of Connors' checks with a uh, scribbled signature on it, and it, it went through because of the magnetic numbers on the bottom of the check. No, there wasn't enough money in the account to cover because they'd drawn it all out for their honeymoon. Well, maybe it was a practical joke, and maybe not. Nobody here seems to know. Well, then, yeah, well, then the chief of police jumped the gun and swore out an arrest warrant. Well, anyway, the bank is not prosecuting. It was their mistake. Now, I'm coming to uh, our mistake, Mr. Sheridan, and I think we'll be making one a big one if you don't get into the action before this news gets out. I mean, people think we thought they were conning us for the hotel room. Well, what I'm saying right now is we ought to invite them back to the hotel and throw them a big party. Or we're going to look mighty silly. This is Don Purvis speaking to you from the courthouse steps in Barrows Point, Maine. Now, let me begin by admitting to you that my face is plenty red. And there are many of us who should be just as embarrassed when they learn the truth. Today, Tuesday the 3rd, should have been the trial of Harold Connor on charges of passing a bad check. Now, all along, Mr. Connor has protested his innocence. And I'm sure all those down in Big City who opened their hearts and their pocketbooks to the Connors will be glad to hear they are completely exonerated. Harold and his sweet, trusting wife, Marge, are here with me and have consented to answer a few questions. Now, Marge, I'm going to start with you first, if I may. Tell me. How does it feel to have your husband vindicated? Fine. It feels just fine. Now, Harold, let me ask you. Has the person or persons who presented a check of yours been caught? No. Where is he? Nobody knows. But the, the, the teller at the bank knows that it wasn't you. Yep. Do they know who it was? Yep. The uh, bank teller remembered. Well, then why hasn't that person been arrested? Because uh, there's no one in Barrows Point who can make an arrest. Well, where's your brother, Augustus? He's the one who left town. I see. Well, why would he do that? I mean, why would anyone want to get you into trouble? Oh, because maybe they were jealous. 
You know, reading about us in the newspapers, being on TV, getting all those free presents and the free good time. Well, I'm not going to embarrass you two by asking you to identify who was suspected because I think it's pretty much common knowledge around these parts. And it's possible this beautiful main town will be getting themselves another chief of police. Oh, they are killed already. But he turned it down. Yep. Lumber is my line. Mr. and Mrs. Connor, on behalf of all those watching this interview, may I ask you to please come back to Big City so that we can show you how much we really love you and admire you. Well, well, well I, I must say Mr. I... Mr. Purvis, uh, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure meeting up with all those fine folk in your hometown, but I think one visit was enough. Right, Popsy? Right, Popsy. To end where we began... Let me quote for you the last verse of our ancient nursery rhyme. Punch and Judy settled down for that hip hip hooray. They had their fill of highwaymen and never strayed away. Now that may be all right for an old fashioned nursery rhyme, but for today, is it a good idea never to leave home because you might run into some bad luck? Perhaps I can come up with an answer when I get back to you, which I intend to do shortly. There is an old saw that tells us the grass is always greener elsewhere and to beware. True, the lights of any big city are fascinating to most folks. But we're not saying don't visit new places. We're saying that real warm and friendly folk are everywhere. So, no matter what happens, or could, isn't it worth it to see what's going on on the other side of the mountain? For who knows what treasure you might find there. What new experience just waiting to be discovered. Our cast included Russell Horton, Marion Haley, Earl Hammond, and Mandel Kramer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Those people will kill me, Rudy. Well, they shall do no such thing. How can you say that? Because I shall go to the district attorney. They'll kill you, too. Well, I shan't permit any hoodlum to push my brother around. But... But the money means nothing to you. In the immortal words of Charles Goodloe Harper, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. And then... I saw it. My brother had just suggested how I could pay off the boss fortune for myself besides. Of course, someone would have to die. But as long as that someone wouldn't be me, what difference would it make in the cosmic scheme of things? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.